Now, you will be excused if you take a while to get to today's um, book of the Old Testament. I won't ask for a show of hands how many people have actually even read Zephaniah. Um, I, honestly, I know I have been through several through the Bible in a year uh, reading programs, and even so, I had no recollection of this book. <laughs> So it did not make a great impression on me until I went to look at it deliberately, to focus on it. And even then, right, we are in the most obscure of the obscure. Uh, the next several books, Zephaniah, Nahum, Obadiah, these are uh, probably going to be the toughest ones to get through in our terms because they aren't on our terms. And you'll understand what I'm saying uh, when we start in Zephaniah, right? So toward the end of the Old Testament, three chapters, who is Zephaniah? All we're told is that he was the son of Cushai, the son of Gedaliah, son of Amariah, son of Hezekiah. So people are like, is that the Hezekiah? We don't know. It could be. So it may be that this is the great grandson of one of the few good kings of Judah. What we do know is that he spoke in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, the last good king of Judah. And he spoke to a, a Judah and Jerusalem, you know, specifically Jerusalem, but, you know, Jerusalem ends up standing for the entirety of Judah, who is living after the days when Assyria has already destroyed the northern kingdom. So it really, you know, to us, we're like, well, they should have looked at that and taken their lesson from that, and they should have. But again, how does it begin? This is the word of the Lord that came to Zephaniah. I will utterly sweep away everything from the face of the earth. <laughs> oh, goody. Another one of those. But look at it closely. When he talks about this coming judgment, listen to the language he uses. I will utterly sweep away everything from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. I will sweep away man and beast. I will sweep away the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea. There's an echo here from Genesis, both the creation and the flood. You remember the promise, I will never again wipe away all of these things. Well, here he's coming and he is reversing that. He says, I will. I will completely, I will utterly sweep all this away. Why? <laughs> because in the place where he had set his name, in the place where he had said, you are my people, I will be your God, there are worshipers of various idols who see no problem worshiping both the idols of the nations and the Lord God. You listen, I will stretch out my hand against Judah and against all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and I will cut off from this place the remnant of Baal and the name of the idolatrous, idolatrous priests along with the priests who bow down on the roofs to the host of heaven. Those who bow down and swear to the Lord, and yet swear by Milcom, and that's the name of one of the local, um, I believe, Ammonite deities, and who have turned back from following the Lord, who do not seek the Lord or inquire of him. So this reversal of creation, really, this reversal of the promise to Noah is because they have placed dead idols on the same level 
as the Lord God. Or you might say they have placed the Lord on the same level as these idols because it's like that, that, that cliche of covering your bases where they are worshiping their God, but just in case, because it couldn't hurt. Well, could it couldn't hurt, really? <laughs> and God is saying, yes, it could hurt. It's going to hurt a lot. And the main idea that runs straight through Zephaniah is this day of the Lord. It is described in a number of terms as a day of sacrifice, as a day of seizing the prey, which is usually a term of like a hunter who has um, successfully hunted his prey, a day of distress, a day of fire, and this is what he is saying will come upon them. Now, of course, in our sense, we think of the day of the Lord as the last day when Jesus will come and the judgment will be held and all will be made new. But in the Old Testament, the day of the Lord has different levels. And in this case, we're talking about a level of conquest, where Judah, like her sister Israel, will go into exile. And of course, this is during the days of Josiah, days of reform. So you would think, well, they're already reforming. Why would they need to send a prophet? But, I mean, you're all old enough to know human nature. Just because a reform is held, just because a revival is held, doesn't mean everybody listens, doesn't mean everybody goes along with it. And I'm gonna guess, and I'm thinking this is an easy, this is like a really safe bet, that along with the reforms that Josiah instituted, people just tacked that on to whatever they were already doing. Hence the bow down and swear to the Lord. And yet, all this other worship of the hosts of heaven, these gods of the surrounding nations. And there's an interesting thing here. Idolatry we get because it's like, all right, so you're placing something on a par with or instead of the true God. Judgment, indeed. But if you look at chapter 1, verse 9, after uh, the, the word of the Lord has said, you know, be silent, the Lord is prepared to sacrifice, etc., 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 and he's talking about who will be punished. And verse 9 says, I will punish everyone who leaps over the threshold. Now, this is uh, some rather unknown uh, religious practice. It could be tied to the Philistine worship of Dagon when, if you'll remember back in the history of Israel, uh, they had captured the ark and put it in the temple with their god Dagon. And in the morning they found the statue of Dagon broken on the threshold. And it said from that day forward, no one who worshiped Dagon would step on the threshold. There's, there's a possibility that that's what they're talking about. So idol worship, but also those who fill their master's house with violence and fraud, injustice, plain common or garden unrighteousness, on a par with and usually tied to false worship. So there is this sense of judgment where not only have they fallen away from the correct ceremonial worship, but in doing so, they have fallen away from the standard that God set for them. And what comes is a punishment of disobedience, of rebellion. Now, we always think of that as a negative thing, but there's an exception to that. 
We want to see people we consider deserving of punishment punished. When someone commits something we consider particularly heinous, I won't mention any current events because I don't think they need mentioning, but people are crying out for punishment. What happens though, I was talking to my dad about with this a few days ago, what happens when somebody then asks you, well, what about what you've done? And everybody's like, well, that was, that was um, understandable, that was excusable, that, that doesn't deserve punishment. Because as soon as it turns on you, and that's what's happening here with Judah. There are warnings as they go through. We'll come up on a section where he's talking about the Philistines, Moab, Ammon, Cush, Assyria, and a series of woes, of warnings to these nations. Right in the heart of a warning against Jerusalem, against Judah. Why? Well, very likely because they had become just like the nations around them. The distinction that they should have upheld as God's people had fallen by the wayside. And something that really struck me as I was reading this this week was verse 12 of chapter 1, where he's talking about searching through Jerusalem as with lamps, like, you know, the searchlight going through, you see some of those old war movies at the prisoner war camps and they got the searchlights along the walls. Think of a searchlight like that going through Jerusalem, looking, and not necessarily for the evil, but looking for good people and not finding any. Instead, what they find, and the description here is, men who are complacent, who say in their hearts, the Lord will not do good, nor will he do ill. Now, of all things, the one thing they should never have forgotten is that God is active. That he interacts with human history on a regular basis, particularly their history. But they had reached a place where they didn't really believe, even if they assented to the fact that God existed, they didn't really believe he would interact with them, that he would take action. And what he's saying here is, guess again, because that verse sort of launches us into a poetic description of the day of the Lord. The great day of the Lord is near, near and hastening fast. The sound of the day of the Lord is bitter. The mighty man cries aloud there. A day of wrath is that day, a day of distress and anguish, a day of ruin and devastation, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of trumpet blast and battle cry against the fortified cities and against the lofty battlements. The day of the Lord, and we, we saw a couple of weeks ago, that there were people who were saying, well, the day of the Lord will be great because all our enemies will be destroyed. And another prophet had told them, eh, you might not want to be cheering too loud for the day of the Lord because <laughs> you have not necessarily been the friend of God. And in this case, we're talking about Judah being described in terms of God's enemy. And so distress will fall on them, not just them, but on all the inhabitants of the earth. There's this little warning stuck in here. If you look at chapter two, verse three, seek the Lord, all you humble of the land who do his just commands, seek righteousness, seek humility, Perhaps you may be hidden on the day of the anger of the Lord. 
So here we have another description of the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord's anger. And he urges those who have not participated in the idolatry and the injustice that surrounds them to seek out in particular obedience righteousness, humility, so that when the day of the anger of the Lord comes, they might be passed over. Again, referring back to their history. Because, and he starts describing the nations that surround them, Gaza, Ashkelon, Ashdod, Ekron, these are the Philistine cities. And they are described as becoming desolate driven out, uprooted. The Carathites, Canaanites, the sea coast, Moab and Ammon, they do not escape because they've taunted the people of the Lord. So they become like Sodom and Gomorrah. You remember fire, brimstone, wasteland. Cushites, it's talking about North Africa, Egypt, that area. Assyria, this was at the time the most powerful nation. Technically, Judah's overlord at this time. And they're described as a desert, a wasteland, the habitation of wild animals. But at the end of the list of warnings and woes, Jerusalem. Woe to her who is rebellious and defiled, the oppressing city. She listens to no voice. She accepts no correction. She does not trust in the Lord. She does not draw near to her God. Her officials within her are roaring lions. Her judges are evening wolves that leave nothing until the morning. Her prophets are fickle, treacherous men. Her priests profane what is holy. They do violence to the law. But the Lord within her is righteous. He does no injustice. Every morning he shows forth his justice. Each dawn he does not fail. But the unjust knows no fame. Now my current daily Bible readings have me going through, of all things, Leviticus, which is a hard passage to go through, Leviticus. But the one thing that is repeated again and again and again is these rules, these ceremonial laws are so that Israel will not endanger themselves with unholiness while the Lord their God is in their midst. Here, the Lord is in their midst, and they have gone beyond endangering themselves. They have condemned themselves. And there's, it's frustrating and it's poignant at the same time. At chapter 3, verse 7, We have the Lord quoted as saying, surely you will fear me, you will accept correction. Then your dwelling would not be cut off according to all that I have appointed against you. But all the more, they were eager to make all their deeds corrupt. So the Lord has said, you know, I will discipline you and you will return to me. And they say, want to bet? (laughs) The more you discipline us, the more we're going to go our own way. So the Lord says, therefore, wait for me. For the day when I rise up to seize the prey. For my decision is to gather nations, to assemble kingdoms, to pour out upon them my indignation, all my burning anger. For in the fire of my jealousy, all the earth shall be consumed. And you know why jealousy is condemned in us? Because we don't own anything. 
we cannot say this is absolutely mine. God, on the other hand, can say that of everything he has made, which is everything. And when everything he has made is rebelling against him, he has every right to destroy what he has made. But a, like many of the other minor prophets, Zephaniah does not leave us with this destruction. What he leaves us with is another reversal. If you look at chapter 3, verse 9 and following, he talks about from that time, I will change the speech of the peoples to a pure speech that all of them may call upon the name of the Lord and serve him with one accord. This should cast your mind back again to a bit of history in Genesis. The Tower of Babel, if you remember the, the situation where all humankind spoke the same language and decided to build a tower to heaven. a sign of their declaring their independence from God. Well, here we have that reversed. Where at Babel, they were divided in speech and could no longer understand each other. The Lord says, there will come a time when I will change their speech to one speech. So that they can call on my name together and serve me. And from there, you have this image of a stream of peoples from all nations coming back to God, offering to him right sacrifices, humble and lowly, seeking refuge in the name of the Lord. And then there's this final poem this is a song, really, of rejoicing. And it goes, you know, sing aloud, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O Israel. Rejoice and exult with all of your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. For the Lord has taken away the judgments against you. He has cleared away your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. And you shall never again fear evil. On that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Fear not, O Zion, let not your hands grow weak, for the Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. That he can say this at a time when what devotion exists is mostly what they call syncretistic. It's mixed with worship to other gods. Suggests that the, the mercy of God will not be erased by the judgment of God. Indeed, he promises that he will take away their reproach. He will change their shame into praise and renown through all the earth. That he will gather them together and restore their fortunes. And all this before they've repented, he promises. But he does not promise it apart from repentance. Just have to keep that in mind. So if we look at the themes that have run through these three chapters. Obviously, the day of the Lord takes top of the list. That the, the Lord will judge sin. The Lord must judge evil. It would go against his character not to. And a lot of that comes from this religious complacency or this syncretism, where they say, well, what does it matter if we worship others as long as we also worship God? 
What does it matter? Let's bring it a little closer to home. If we give our time and our hearts to other things, as long as we still show up to church and we go to Bible school study and, and, and we pray, what does it matter? God is saying it matters an awful lot. What he's looking for is pure worship. That there is no other God but him. And so judgment usually precedes hope. And this is, a, we're, we're in that section where there aren't really very many New Testament links. There's one possible quote from Zephaniah in the New Testament, and it's probably not at all surprising that that would be in Revelation. <laughs> if you want to talk about the day of the Lord. Revelation 14 and verse 5 says, In their mouth no lie was formed, for they are blameless. And that, right, looks back to Zephaniah 3, 13. Those who are left in Israel, they shall do no injustice. They shall speak no lies, nor shall there be found in their mouth a deceitful tongue talking about after judgment when God brings redemption. So very tenuous link there, but it is there. So I don't expect this to have made you fall in love with the book of Zephaniah, <laughs> but to be aware that, well, first off, scripture is not about us. It's about God. So when you hit these passages that you can't really appropriate for your own situation, that you can't really find inspiration for your own life out of, it's a good reminder that the character of God is what we're looking at here. And that character of God does not change. That it's indeed that he does take us as we are, but he does not leave us as we are. That discipline is not a sign of his hatred, but a sign of his redeeming love. But that hope always remains at the end for those who stay faithful, for those <laughs> humble in the land who do obey even when everyone else does not. that he will hide them in the day of his anger. And that he actually does act. That's the one thing that I think I will take away from Zephaniah is that I need to expect him to act. And yeah, not necessarily in the way I want him to, the way I expect him to, but I need to expect that God is active. I need, need to be looking for him to act. So that's Zephaniah. <laughs>